Okami is the best 3D Zelda clone that isn't a Zelda clone, and even then, calling it the best is pushing it a little bit. I know that's a pretty bold statement to open a video with, but after trudging through Okami again in order to do this video, that's just how it left me feeling. I had originally planned on making a longer look at Okami and how it's held up over the years since release, seeing as it's such a beloved and revered game by many, fans and critics alike. And even after an HD re-release, it seems to have faded into obscurity, save for mentions of fondness over the art style and Amaterasu's appearance in Marvel vs Capcom 3 for some reason. One of its main selling points was how it's one of the best 3D Zelda clones out there. IGN stated, It might not quite be on the same level as Zelda, but it's probably the best thing we've seen outside of Nintendo. While GameSpot remarked, it takes its cues from the Legend of Zelda series, in particular, and achieves similarly outstanding results. Look at any list of the best 3D Zelda clones, and you'll be hard pressed not to find Okami sitting there, probably in between 3D Dot Heroes and Darksiders. This has led me to think about what defines a clone of a game, in particular a Zelda one, and where the line of distinction between influence and copy is drawn. So with this video, I want to go through the core tenets of a Zelda game, and where Okami ticks those boxes, discussing along the way the differences between an influence and a downright clone. Okami released to extremely high critical praise, but poor sales selling around only 600,000 copies all up earning it a place in the Guinness Book of World Records in 2009 as the least commercially successful game to win a Game of the Year award, a title it still holds to this day. This has left me thinking, did its direct Zelda comparisons hurt sales? As we were on the cusp of the next new Zelda game in 4 years after several delays and an upcoming new console, or did it actually manage to help this weirdly different and obscure title? In Capcom's post Resident Evil 4 climate, who Clover Studios were an in-house developer for, the only commercially successful game of the ambitious Capcom 5 project, it's clear the wider world wasn't ready for something as abstract as a cell shaded game about a wolf with a paintbrush. But whether or not these comparisons, unfair or not, had any effect, may never be known. Influenced by and clone of are two very close but distinctly different terms and can paint media in starkly contrasting lights. For example, Freedom Planet is often referred to as a clone of the original 2D Sonic games, while at the same time building upon the foundations of what it wants to be in its own unique way. This is the easiest example of a clone I can think of, and I don't want to badmouth clone games here. I think there is a lot of value in copying a formula and building upon any area that could be propped up in some way. It's just some have managed to do it with more style and grace than others. While a work that is clearly influenced by something can be a totally different beast entirely, practically any piece of media with orcs owes their existence to Tolkien. But to say every piece of fantasy featuring big brutish humanoids is just a copy of Lord of the Rings is way too extreme to ever be true. At least that's where I stand before I write and dive into the rest of this subject. Maybe it'll change by the end. Like I said, I don't think Okami is a Zelda clone. It's easily got some pretty obvious inspiration from Nintendo's Little Green Tunic Adventure series, and Kamiya has even stated one of his favourite games is A Link to the Past. But just because my favourite movie is Starship Troopers, doesn't mean if I ever make a piece of sci-fi media, it's going to be a clone, but it most certainly will be influenced by it in some way because it will be the reason I've been drawn to the genre. Okay, so what makes the foundation of a 3D Zelda game? Keep in mind at the time of Okami's release, the only three games it could be a clone of were Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and Wind Waker. Although most of the home console Zelda games do share the same core tenants, these are the only ones I'll be pulling from directly for the sake of comparison. The three major things I'll be focusing on are dungeons, combat, and companions, and how differently Nintendo and Clover handled them all. Before we get into the three key points of Zelda, I want to talk about the story structure of Okami, because it's something I hadn't seen done before or ever since. Not to say it hasn't been done, just that if it has, I haven't witnessed it. I mainly want to talk about this now because I will be making references to it throughout the video. Okami has three story arcs. I looked around and could only find them referred to as the first, second, and third arc. Unimaginative, but functional. One thing I distinctly remember about my time with Okami back in 2006 is it seemed to be nearing its resolution several times, only to have a new, bigger and badder villain be the actual root of the issue. I both love and hate this approach. I love it because after beating the first major threat, Orochi, it turns out there is more game to play, which is awesome. The first arc is only 8 hours long, so if it turned out to be actually this short, players may have felt somewhat ripped off back at release. What's bad about it is, by the time of the third arc, Things are ramped up so high, but it's so hard to latch on and care because the game is so focused on its lowly enemies that it loses focus with the actual evil entity, making it hard to care or sympathize with the plight of a world-ending threat seeing as we've done it so many times in one game. Overall, it just loses tension. But seeing as how story has never been the strong suit of the Zelda series, it certainly has its moments. But for the most part, other elements compensate for the retreading of story beats time and time again. So 
definitely Okami is not a clone of Zelda in its story. Possibly holding the closest ties between the two games, dungeons are the bread and butter of any Zelda title, 2D or 3D. There is a set design and style that has remained relatively consistent from start to finish, and when the flip from pixels to polygons happened, combat took a backseat for a more puzzle solving approach that people have come to love about the series. Okami however puts combat over puzzles in a big way, and whatever brain teasers are meant to be present aren't so much as mind benders as they are small roadblocks to gate progression until you have the celestial brush technique required to advance further. Okami's core mechanic, using your paintbrush of the gods to manipulate the world around you, also becomes its biggest downfall, since there is only so much that can be done before the motions become too convoluted to remember and use at will. So credit where credit is due. Kamiya and his team did a good job at keeping all 13 main non-secret brush strokes extremely simple to use at any given time. Unfortunately though, this means only so much can be done in terms of dungeon design. What should be these huge monumental tests of knowledge and skills with the celestial brush just turns out to be linear walks with no real weight or depth, save for a few sparse moments strewn throughout. What constitutes a dungeon may change between each person, but here are the ones I think count, and I'm gonna get these names wrong. From the first arc, Pseudo Ruins, Gale Shrine, and Moon Cave. The second arc, the sunken ship and the imperial palace count as one, since there is no boss in the ship, just an item used to gain access to the later where the boss is actually found inside the emperor's body. Which leaves only Oni Island for the middle season, and finally Waku Palace in the third, final, and by far shortest arc. The first dungeon, Pseudo Ruins, arrives around 3-4 to four hours into the game, proving the focus on dungeons isn't a key one when compared. This dungeon contains the celestial brush technique, Vine which can act as this game's equivalent of the hookshot, there are a couple of good moments for little bits of player puzzle solving, but are undermined by the game itself. Like when you enter this room after defeating these two bud ogres, the camera draws you to a log with a mushroom on it. After approaching it, Eson pipes up and gives you the solution straight away, which is to draw the sun in the sky, before you even had a chance to think for yourself. This kind of hint giving would be fine if there was a Navi or title like prompt where, if you were truly stuck, a little push in the right direction was given, but to just be told outright is boring and means there isn't much fun on the player's end to be had. Even just a little brain squeeze like this which would involve panning the camera up to the roof wouldn't be all that exciting. The fact players aren't even granted such a little slice of it proves the focus lies in combat over puzzles. I know Pseudo Ruins is the first dungeon so you could easily draw these little giveaways as tutorials of sorts. But this trend only continues, as Eason explains everything before you get the chance to do anything, with very few exceptions. Waku Shrine is the last and by far the game's longest dungeon, and features its most complicated puzzle. Even then it's almost insultingly easy. Atop the shrine and outside a machine is churning out snow to cover the land below to turn it into a frozen wasteland. In order to stop the machine and gain Amaterasu's last brush stroke, you must stop these gears spinning in a specific way. To find that way, a hole must be blown in the wall right next to it, using a cherry bomb to summon an explosive from the realm of gods. Then use Gale Storm to command some wind and blow away a pile of leaves revealing the way the gears must be stopped. And then going back outside using Inferno, the stroke that lets Emmy create a line of fire from a source to any point she deems, needs to be used to melt the liver, and then Power Slash, your bread and butter simple celestial attack move, to stop the spinning wheels in the way shown inside the cave. All up, this only uses 4 of the 12 techniques on hand at this point in time, but it's still a nice mix of using these skills to reach a solution. And it's a massive shame it's halfway through the last dungeon, and nothing else like this is really seen anywhere. Most Zelda dungeons revolve around a key puzzle element or idea that set the principles of how to approach each situation, most famous of which is the water temple in Ocarina, raising or lowering the water levels to reach new floors, or the giant pillar in Majora's Snowhead to the same effect. Nothing like this is found in Okami, which normally would be fine in its own right, but there isn't much of a replacement to compensate it all. Keys, which is a pretty essential part of how Zelda dungeons are designed, are carried in Ami's mouth, meaning that you can only have one at a time and used immediately after being picked up, never hoarded for later use. Whereas in Zelda, a lot of the time Link can end up with multiple keys in his pocket, making it so there could be a long gauntlet of puzzles or challenges before winding up back to the locked door. Unlike an Okami, it's usually just a door around the corner where you picked it up, or at most, not a long series of things in your way. The very first boss, Spider Queen, is the most Zelda-like boss in the entire game, having to draw vines using that spiffy new grappling hook technique just gained, to open her body to attack a set of eight eyes. Okay, yeah, this game is weird, but the approach is very Zelda-like. So there is a big tick here in the clone of her influence camp. I wouldn't say the Spider Queen is exactly like any one boss from the Zelda series in mechanics, 
but it's easy to see it pulled from the Goma fight in Wind Waker, using a grappling hook to expose a weak point and then going hard on it. The same can be said about the rest of the bosses in the game. Since most brush techniques, especially those found in dungeons, just involve drawing a line from one point to another, the way bosses need to have these strokes used against them is largely the same, just with different elements. Take Ninetales, who is weak to lightning, and just holds up the very obviously a lightning rod sword in the middle of a thunderstorm, when you just gain the thunderstorm technique. It's not hard to figure out what to do, but even with the obvious presentation, the execution is exactly the same as everything before. Just draw a line between two points, attack, repeat. So how similar are Okami and Zelda's approach to dungeon design? Well, bosses definitely are copied over. Not in style, but the way they're executed with things you gain in the dungeon in order to beat them. Outside of that, you can see the skeleton of what could be Zelda dungeons here in Okami, but with focus on combat over puzzles means their core design philosophies are completely different in the end, resulting in very linear and at most times boring, tedious experiences. But perhaps we could find more similarities in combat? Combat in Zelda games has never been deep or even particularly interesting. There's a lot of waiting for your time to strike without much sense of looming danger. The most exciting combat at this point is the Iron Knuckle mini boss fight in the Spirit Temple as Child Link. It's tense, slow, methodical, and can turn at any moment with a single wrong move. It's the perfect encounter and I wish there was more like it throughout, but there is one thing from that transition to 3D. Z targeting. Not only is this all too intuitive method for fluid 3D combat a cornerstone of Zelda design, it quickly became a staple for any game with real time 3D combat. With Z targeted lock on being the staple it was just seven years after Ocarina of Time's inception, it's weird that Kamiya and his team at Clover left it out for Okami's combat encounters. Almost 20 years after the fact, it's hard replaying Okami without something that has become so deeply baked into the vocabulary of games, but that's just looking at it now with a retrospective lens. And it's not like Kamiya hasn't used the lock on system before. The Devil May Cry series heavily relied on it. Outside of a few situations where there are one too many enemies in the close off arena, there is one point where no lock on becomes egregious, and that's the first major boss, the eight headed dragon Orochi. Orochi as a boss is not the most exciting, and considering how majorly they're built up, he winds up being a pretty big letdown, making the use of the water sprout technique to control some sake and get him drunk. While it's pretty funny and leans into Okami's lighthearted nature, doing this eight times per fight, and after the third time you're forced to fight Orochi, it wears way too thin. What hurts about there being no Z targeting equivalent is when you want to fire off ranged attacks. It's a crapshoot of what head you'll be hitting. It's situations like this that make this purposeful design choice incredibly confusing. With that said, to argue Okami has a deeper combat system than Zelda may be an overstatement. It's definitely more interesting while maintaining a faster pace. But in terms of depth, it's like sidestepping from a rain puddle into a slightly bigger puddle that had a bit more trickle in. So Okami has three weapon types with a main and sub equipment slot. Reflectors, the default all-rounder choice, which are close range when used as a primary or act as shields in the secondary spot. Rosaries, which are long range whips in the main equip or a series of quick bullets when subbed. Finally, there are glaives, which have the ability to charge up primary or do widespread damage as the sub. This is a lot of options to be fair, and it is nice to be able to find a style best suited for each player. It feels good switching things up to get a combination that feels right for you, but options doesn't necessitate depth. Each enemy still requires the same approach spam until dead. There are things like Godhood which, through the act of performing longer combos, gives Emmy an increasingly higher amount of invulnerability to enemy attacks, but these can be cheesed pretty easily and feels like it defeats the purpose. What the dungeons lack in puzzle solving, some enemy encounters tend to make up for, making you figure out when to use the celestial brush technique to lower their defenses, and it's all there and happening which is why Okami's puddle is a splash deeper than Zelda's one. Take the Ubemi enemy for example. This crane comes just after Ami learns the Gale Storm brushstroke and carries its own umbrella. Not exactly a brain buster, but since Ison doesn't interject during combat scenarios, it's that little bit of instruction you're not given earlier. As time in the game goes on, the cosmetic design of enemies stays consistently amazing, but the encounters get less interesting, relying more and more on brute force. Adding to this that every weapon gained after defeating a boss keeps Ami's damage output consistent with how powerful enemies become, the game never truly ramps up in difficulty, keeping players at a similar level throughout. It's still nicer than Zelda's weapon upgrade approach, which is more for dungeon puzzle solving than it is for combat because say for fire attacks, the Deku shield will always block damage. And the only reason to upgrade Child Link to the big Hylian shield is so he can get up Death Mountain, not withstand harder enemies. The same goes for the mirror shield. It's specifically for the Spirit Temple's puzzles and boss fight. It won't increase his stamina or stagger meter because that's just not how Zelda works. It is easy for Okami's combat style to line up with developers' intentions. If you look at Kamiya's reply to a tweet in 2015 asking, why is Okami easier than your other games? He replied, 
because there should be no difficulty when reading folklore. Whether or not this was just a sassy and facetious game developer known for being a wild card online remains to be seen, but it does make sense. Okami has an interesting story structure and can really draw out its cutscenes, so it seems to fit that combat difficulty took a backseat to help players progress. In the end, Okami and Zelda's combat could not be more different, and seeing as how Okami puts a lot of its puzzling elements into combat situations as opposed to dungeon designs themselves, to me it pulls it even further away from what should be considered a clone. I struggled with the idea of adding companions to this section. Considering Wind Waker was left out, Tetra speaks to Link through the pirate's charm she slips into his pocket before launching him off her ship, but it's not the key focus of how you Z-target enemies or look at points of interest. Nor is she, or later on the King of Red Lions, available for quick hints as you need, and so it's fairly safe to say Nintendo left out companions for the cell shaded adventure. But seeing as how integral companions are in the Nintendo 64 outings, it's hard not to consider them as part of the early design of 3D Zelda. Now as much as I love Majora's title, and am incredibly indifferent to Ocarina's Navi, neither of them hold a candle to Isun. The little bouncing Ponkle has so much personality and carries each conversation while speaking on behalf of our silent wolf protagonist with clumsy charm. Despite some questionable behaviours best left in the mid-2000s, it's hard not to love him all the same. Where Isun fails is his underutilization outside of story moments. Only occasionally bouncing in an orange light, different to his usual green tone, to mark some points of interest, but without an obvious button prompt or that obnoxious call of Navi's hey listen or the slight ring of Tattle's bell noise, it's hard to know when to look out for him, and usually the things he wants to draw Amy's attention to are of no significance. There is however one point Isong gets a moment in the sun outside of conversation which is really neat, I just wish it happened more. Halfway through the second arc, in the time between the sunken ship and going deep inside the Emperor's body to fight Blight, Amaterasu is shrunk down to Isun's size, where she can then launch him off her to grab some out of reach treasure. It's a fun switch up that falls into what seems to be Okami's pattern, severely underutilizing interesting moments in favor of playing it safe. Isun could be the result of taking influence from the Zelda series, a little companion to be the voice of a silent protagonist, keeping NPCs from talking and reacting to a muted blank slate, which is always very weird. What we're left with though is a companion who far outshines his contemporaries and I'm so glad this sprightly bug exists because Okami would not be the same without him. So what can be gained from proving that Okami isn't a direct Zelda clone? Honestly I just wanted an excuse to talk about Okami and this was a more interesting way to approach an analysis, at least for me, but I also think that outright calling something a clone isn't just an arbitrary means to tell someone about a game. It can potentially be damaging. I'm not saying had news outlets in 2006 made direct comparisons to one of Nintendo's biggest franchises, suddenly the sales of Okami would have skyrocketed and it wouldn't hold its Guinness Book of World Records title. But maybe those on the fence just decided to wait a few extra months to play the real Zelda with a wolf. A lot of things get written off or forgotten about because the creators love the piece of media and wanted to carve something out of its image. Spec Ops The Line or Apocalypse Now wouldn't exist without Heart of Darkness, but that doesn't discredit those that came later. In fact, I think their respective mediums are stronger for them existing as a result. Okami is far from perfect. It's also far from a Zelda clone, but I think it definitely deserved a lot more than it got. Sure, it scored a bit too high in my eyes, but I also think review scores are incredibly dumb, so that doesn't mean much. Looking at its sales though, despite how much people claim to love this game, there sure as hell haven't been that many that played it, which is a goddamn shame. <laughs>